Hello there, my name is Dasha Kelly Hamilton. I'm the Poet Laureate for the City of Milwaukee and for the State of Wisconsin. I am overjoyed to be able to celebrate our emerging poet voices this year. I know we had a little thing called a virus and a pandemic that kept us from gathering last year. And even though we're still together virtually, I'm excited that we're able to put some virtual and digital love around these three exciting voices. Now emerging just suggests that they are, in my opinion, that they are pouring themselves into their work in a fresh way. But I'm excited to say these voices are not unfamiliar. So does it mean that they're new? Emerging means that they've been around, they've been shaping their craft, they've been defining their aesthetic, and they've been saying no to a lot of other influences that all of us go through along the journey of really finding our voice. So I just wanted to make that clarification that these poets we're gonna to celebrate today, none of them are brand new to this game. They are incredibly talented. They have been around for more than a minute. And at this point, we are all going to be able to celebrate and recognize in them and with them the journeys that their works are taking. So before we hear from them, I have a few pieces I'm going to share along the way. And this idea of shaping voice, there are pieces that are relatively new that are possibly topics or approaches that along the journey I may not have had the confidence or may not have felt that anyone else would have wanted to or been able to relate. So that is all also to say that we are always always emerging as artists and as poets. So this first piece is called Let's Go. Mark and set, one, two does not guarantee three. Let us go. Perhaps if we delete contractions, dissuade abbreviations, discourage any swallowing of letters, we don't always know the strength of our clenched fingers tight around what we believe, what we think, what we think we think we know. Especially if our knowing is only holding on, hanging tight. Let's go. Step into the process of moving onward. Go. Let us mind our sunrises smooth through our horizon falls. The sun collapses again and again. Let us. Again, and again, go again, and again. Matthew James Gutierrez is an author of a bilingual poetry book entitled Notes I Wrote Along the Way. He obtained a bachelor's in science and a master's in educational psychology from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. As an undergraduate, he studied creative writing, focusing on fiction and poetry. Other experiences include screenplay and television writing courses at UCLA. Everyone, let's welcome Matthew. Hello, everyone. My name is Matthew Gutierrez. Um, born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I've uh, been writing since I was a teenager, um, which was many, many moons ago. However, I didn't decide until a few years ago that I was going to write um, in terms of having it published. Before I was just writing for myself, just thought I was just, you know, writing my emotions on the paper, just for me. But then I got this bright idea. I said, you know what? I'm gonna start trying to publish these. I'm gonna try to get them out there. Why keep them to myself, right? Let other people read them. Anyway, on with the show. I'm going to read from a book I published in October called Notes I Wrote Along the Way. I hope you enjoy. All right. I'm going to open with a poem called A Loner and a Ghost. Uh, this was a poem I wrote to a friend of mine. Uh, he passed away in 2002, the young age of 18. Loner and a ghost. My dear friend, you're a ghost. I welcome memory sitting in the passenger side. A ride that is yet to end. It's been quite some years, yet here we are. A loner and a ghost. Still passing through these seasoned city streets. I see your image often, deep in facial lines, twins of a kind, and family members you left behind. Aging has left its mark on my soul and weakened my heart. But you, you possess a youthful smile in the eyes of 18 years and full of hope, wide-eyed and ready to take a rebellious bite out of life. A friend, a sunset, car rides through the ambitious night, discussing girls, sex, 
heartaches and headaches. Big city streets designed as a playground for young hearts and carefree concerns, living for the moment, the minutes and hours at hand. Headphones and constant conversations, unaware if the words were directed to me or the universe as you negotiated ways to see another day. Rolling the dice on a game of chance, equipped with a deck of unanswered questions, constantly reminded of what was so perfectly pointed out at birth. Play by play, one mysterious morning, and unanswered calls, seeking and searching, door to door, nothing left to explore. Hospital hallways painted an ominous picture of reality, a dark tragedy, having to admit that tomorrow may never come, that there will never be another rise of the sun. While years have passed and times have changed, one thing remains, deep inside my mind, that long lasting ride, here we are again, a loner and a ghost. Okay. <clears throat> this poem is called Longing. She is as precious as the sun is yellow, a warm cheek to run your hand over. Her skin is soothing and addictive in a preferable manner. A shot of passion, fresh air infused into my soul, a burned bridge repaired, a pathway to a sought after sanity. Her smile burned right at the edge of my memory bank. From loose soil, she pulled me like a flower. Pressure applied as her fingers ran freely. Movements under the moon. I am so far gone. Tender shadow, silly demons that no longer haunt these streets. An alleyway where we meet under a lamppost. I watch as she greets me. Her heart emotionally feeds me. A lasting memory of when the stars and planets provided her for me. Freely, directly, in some distant world. I long for her to long for me. When she is away, it's as if time and space are colored with paints that are mixed with delusion. <clears throat> okay. This next poem is called Appreciation. A deep thank you to life. This has been a valuable lesson indeed, one which I will use as I move along. She was a teacher, a valuable instructor in my approach, my beliefs, and perception. I bid her a farewell as we softly and gently part ways. I am uncertain if a hug or handshake would work best. Words could be said, but at this moment, they do not matter. Nothing can change the outcome. It was inevitable from the start. The writing was on the wall before we entered the room. Deep down, we knew this day would come, that this scene would play out as it has in so many dramatic productions. We were no different, no stranger to the will of life, the shifting from day to day, moment to moment. I tried to love her, perhaps I was wrong, or didn't know any better, naive in many ways. My back to the sun, bag on my shoulder, the clouds serve as my guide for the long road ahead. Flowers in the wind, a summer breeze and a dirt flooring as the quiet and tranquil surroundings welcome me. <clears throat> okay. This next poem is called Beautiful Life. Well, mm -hmm. Life can be beautiful. It sure is. As a child, I created ideas of what life should have been and how it may play out, like characters brought to stage in reflection of all that was me. I came to breathe the same air that produced creativity and bright colors to the minds of melancholy. I believe that progress meant going forward, that finding hope meant grasping the unseen, but I may be mistaken. There's no sin in going backwards or letting go of what has yet to exist. Mountains of moments and memories, a life full of unexplained mishaps and missed opportunities. I run my hands over an image that burns like a wildfire. There is beauty in a painting that lacks perfection. The mess is obvious, but the journey is beautiful. <clears throat> yes, indeed, life can be a mess, but a beautiful mess indeed. <clears throat> this poem is called Meeting a Stranger. Let's talk. Open with what you like and dislike. What brings joy to your day? And if the sun breaks into your bedroom from the east or the west? Say something out loud, what you refuse to tell yourself alone under the shelter of the darkness in your home. Have you any jokes? Can you make me laugh? 
Let's discuss your favorite piece of pie and which flavor tea opens your eye. Pretend I am your journal. Lay your worries and troubles upon my pages. Write the words that sat in your heart and bring tears to those big brown eyes. Maybe it would be best if we spoke of cheer, happier times, when your family spent summers by the lake, exchanged holiday hugs, held hands around the table as an elder led prayer. Pick a topic, whatever topic you please. I long to sit on this bench and listen to the words that make up your mysterious life. <clears throat> okay. All right, enjoy the moment. We just are, and at this moment, that is good enough. <clears throat> Living in the now, engulfed and smothered in it, to enjoy her today and care not for what may come tomorrow, taking time to laugh out loud with her, childish manners as I play alongside of her, holding her hand as nature pretends not to watch, kissing her fingers and forehead, these gentle reassurances of appreciation. Back scratches and bear hugs, hoping to never let go. Horseback rides, handshakes, and high fives. One sunset and moonrise at a time, never looking forward or too far back. Eyes locked on smiles, feelings that forgot how to work. A heart pounding and thoughts racing. We will ponder what may or may not when the stars set the stage on a day that has yet to exist. Good one there. Enjoy the moment. Just enjoy the moment you are in right now. Enjoy life. <clears throat> okay. Uh, the next one I'm going to read is called God's Storyboard. Hmm. It's as if God has a storyboard behind him at his desk and everybody's on it. A collection of unknown art. Pieces on a wall, a gallery of scenes resembling my life. Push them together so that they may tell a story. Conversation pieces for the well-to-dos. Dramatized with uncertainty, second-guessing to the grandest of degrees. A self-portrait for each year forgotten. The hardships brushed between the lines on my palms. I, bar I barely recognize who I was once upon a time. I often reflect and cringe at those naive moments. Life has taught me well, schooled me in a sense, educated me on the wisdom of where exactly my place belongs in the ever-shifting universal portrait hanging on God's wall of shame. It's true, it's true. Life will school you. And to show you where you belong in life, everybody has a place and a purpose. This one is called Lifelong Story. It is on glorious mornings such as this that I look back at all that had been and what has not been in my life. I welcome memories of the past. Some greet me with a wide smile dipped in sunshine while mentioning moments based on joy and fulfillment. And others that haunt me like monsters in a closet. They remind me of pain and angst, the past not too far behind in footprints, yesterday mixed with a small pinch of tomorrow, my ghost remains in places that I regret leaving it behind. Emotions written on my brain with permanent marker. I hope that all is well with those I have experienced in passing, as you too. May I be a fond memory in past tales they tell children. It is better to have lost me than to never have known me. I do not remember names. Old age has gifted me with, with forgetfulness but I do recall feelings created in my presence. The smiles, the tears, love, or the lack thereof. They linger within these poems, these lines. They made imprints on my journey through this life, building a skyscraper of a story that may never be written. Hopefully I am writing it right now. <clears throat> All right. Recreating romance. Here I am at the beginning, having to retell my story, explaining who I am, what I should have been, and who I want to be. New exchanges begin with a handshake and end with a hug. Discovering the color of your eyes while imprinting your smile into my memory. What makes you laugh? What makes you cry? 
What wakes you up in the morning and tickles the curiosity in your soul? Explain to me the day, the year, and month which the angels brought you into this world, matching the signs and stars to your personality and past lives. What's that tattoo on your right shoulder? Does it mix with my mood? Mm. <clears throat> ah, that one I wrote, I did meet a stranger. She had a nice tattoo on her shoulder. All right. This one is called Imaginary Home. It's time to go. The train is boarding. Stamp my ticket. I am a passenger seeking refuge in some other station in some other part of the world. My surroundings no longer suits me. It refuses to change. These people, these faces, some shift, but the majority remain the same. They foolishly insist they know me, perhaps on a surface level, yes, but they never searched for the soul inside, whispers and rumors of who I may be, conjured up stories of which character I play. My story, pre-written by the hands of outsiders, they refuse to let me edit or correct errors, to shed my skin or assume a new identity. The pressures and expectations remain. I must move on if I am to grow. Forcefully, the environment must change. Yeah, I think I wrote that one. You kind of think about sometimes, you know, if you ever felt like uh, you just kind of don't belong where you are anymore and you need a new scenery. You need a new environment. <clears throat> this one is called Creativity Wasted. I was molded into an abandoned dream, broken on purpose, executed to a demanding degree. Class with no walls to hang upon, no hands to reach for, time wasted on creativity without a calling. The meaning of life gone over my head, wasted hope and dreams left on the roadside, an empty pen and blank paper, and a misspelled signature. I am the founding father of failure. My head hung so low that it looks to the sky. The rain disguises my tears. Forgive me, father, mother, creator of all. I have wasted what was given to me. You have my promise, pinky swear, my effort will be greater should this writing itch follow me in the next life I am granted. That one there kind of is just, you know, I was writing since a teenager, but I didn't start putting it out until a couple years ago. So I kind of felt like, you know, with this one, I should have been doing it earlier. I should have been doing a lot more. I pinky swear I will in my next life. You have my promise. Okay. <clears throat> this one is called connecting the energy the synergy who am i to you behind a curtain filled with mystery and wonder unaware but so sure that i want to be near you fingertips touch eyes closed i feel your face to understand your eternal story stare into your eyes speaking to your soul our toes touch as we inch closer your naked body slowly presses against mine Familiarity and nerves working together as one. Our hearts beat faster, our movements lost in the knowledge that we are new to one another. A slow process, discovering who you are and what you like. Silent questions while sounds provide answers. Come to me, give yourself away. I'll hand over my lost ways. Let's be found on an island where our bodies can grow in and out of position where time is no longer relevant, our separate lives mixed together as one, bonded and labeled fragile, to be handled gently by the moon in hopes that we are not broken. Okay. All right, for my last one, I'm going to read Universal Control. There are moments that define us and provide clarity in the same manner, a broken window provides sunlight to a dying fern. Birds gather up forgotten expectations and carry them to safety. High in a pine tree, a mother feeds her future. A gust of wind propels thoughts over restless waters. The ocean is home. Cleanse we shall and burdens be washed. Untamed rocks provide safety to seagulls while stabbing fishermen in the back as boats brace for impact. One thing we can all agree, nature is free. Dust settles as fog falls into view. A soul searches through hidden canals and rivers that flow. Whispers from strangers that once walked this path. They too searched for shelter from a short-tempered universe.
Thank you very much. The book is called Notes I Wrote Along the Way. I hope you enjoyed some of the poems that are in the book. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for allowing me to be here. I hope you have a great day. Uh, enjoy yourself and take it easy. Divining. Maybe it's nothing. Too many hugs, too few chances, detritus of millennia blurring lineage. Maybe it's not the work of gods rattling scattered femurs and leaves. Don't you already wish upon words, bones, and stars? Trace some knowing etched into your nature, summoning the wind, bending time. Maybe it's not a thing. Maybe you've always been fluent in dreams. Brian Cherry is a poet and a musician. He is the author of a chapbook of poetry, Funeral Journey Through the Quail, Pre Through the Quail Press, and a full-length collection of poems, Ruins, Ruminations, and Rituals Through an Archer Welfare Press, both published in 2019. His work has also been featured in Return to the Gathering Place of Waters Anthology through the Vegetarian Alcoholic Press, as well as in South Florida Poetry Journal, Born and raised in Milwaukee, he is of and shaped by his evolving home city. He is guided by what he considers to be magical forces, listening and love. Let's welcome Byron. Hello, hello. I am Brian Cherry. You are whoever you are. And that is amazing and special. Uh, what else is special? is getting to gather with you guys in any manner that we can right now. Um, felt I felt really honored to be asked to be a part of this, uh, this program. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Um, thank you, St. John's, for asking me to be a part of this. Um, I want to start off by reading some poems from a chapbook that came out in 2019 of mine. It's called Funeral Journey. Um, it was came out in the Quell Press. And <clears throat> this first poem is about using YouTube to find poets reading their poems. And this one is called Watching Frank O'Hara Reading Having a Coke With You. Cigarette is held as if transformed into a right-hand afterthought. Where's the ash that that cigarette created? That was 1966. It is now 52 years after he listed places that I still have no idea about. That ash has to be somewhere, probably not as ash, but as what and where. 52 years ago was one year after Congress decreed that packs of cigarettes would carry a warning. Caution. Cigarette smoking may be hazardous to your health. This mosaic man whose eyes grazed the camera exactly four times in the one minute and 45 seconds, who mentions seven severed locales which rise through the fragmentation, occasionally moves the cigarette to rhythm on the emphasis words. Was he concerned about what this eternal cigarette and all the other smoky silhouette-inducing cylinders, colloquially squares, might do to him. So many cigarette pictures of this man. So much zagging language, like Chinese lanterns of flame in the sky, filled with numerous, luminous, cold constellations. The sky, his gentle tongue. In a few short numbered days from this poem's recitation, Fire Island waits to cull him. I just hope he was not concerned about the potential for cigarette death. It helps me to believe that those ashes endings are now somehow a part of a red winged blackbird slumbling about in dew damp Kentucky bluegrass nascent Midwest spring. That at least some of his body's molecules have become grime, that is, mucking up the painting of a young man on his horse at the Frick Collection in New York City. Um, so this next one, 
has taken on greater importance to me, at least um, with everything that's been going on the past year. It's called War Games. It helps not to be so human. It humans not to help being so helpless as ground grumbles under shanking steps, as the moon waxes under uncertain wings, these machines less than care. These metaphors of opening earth, in the distance, salutations are given to less than an acquaintance. Intangible blurry images image us as an aberration from non-being. These are just places, monsters who act maudlin in memory. The bedroom floor, its bent nature, its slippery acts of violent valor. Look at the gist of the gyrations as they topple delicately placed cairns. The earth is a tomb and a womb. We are of the earth. What are we? Uh, so the last one I'll read from this, this chapbook is one that occurred right in this kitchen where I'm coming live and direct. Well, not so live. I'm in the past from where you guys are at watching this, but that's a whole other logistical thing to think about. But happened in my kitchen. It's about my son. It's called Pear and Bluish Ceramic Bowl. This pear it sits in bowl, kitchen bending itself to keep it. In a number of days that is already written, it will be lovingly cut and skinned into seven pieces. A son, soon to be two, will eat the honeyed flesh of four of the section pieces. And between impermanent handfuls of macaroni and cheese, with a mouth engorged with sustenance, he will point to the ceiling fan. What's that, Daddy? It is my first time here too, son. I drift, drip, trying to find my mind. When was that pear attached to tree? What composition did the soil harbor? What machine or human harvested it? What truck jostled it across mannerisms of fissured land? Matter cannot be created nor destroyed? Who tells these stories? Can they be asked if this son's matter had ever lain with this pair's matter while woven into the emptiness prior to the story of the Big Bang? Time is just gravity, or is it the other way around? Almost two years old, almost infinity, almost a boy, almost a pair. Uh, so I think we'll continue down the road talking about my, things I do with my kids. This poem is about going to the zoo. It's called Eligibility Verification. It seemed like all the people procreating these days end up at the zoo on Saturday mornings as soon as the zoo opens at 9 in the a.m., it seemed like a good percentage of them have the people that procreated them in tow. All this is sex. All this is holy. All this is mundane. The penguins jump in, out, in, out of concurring water. This is a 51 degree grayscale spring day where the polar bear looks dirty and full of scrums sleeping on a rock. How many winners of the death struggle to make it to the next generation are armed with fruit snacks? Snacks that do not taste of fruit. Facade alluding to the wildness emerged. It all reeks of a gentleness one can barely feel. Fitness, finessing patterns out these humans. Humans, finessing patterns out this fitness. Uh, so this one was kind of a dream that I had <laughs> and yeah, and then it gets to be kind of about, you know, not taking yourself too seriously. <clears throat> it's called Uncontrolled Intersections number four. 
I'm at the fake granite countertop in my small burst orange kitchen with a bird, probably 43 ounces of bird, bird which has never known flight or been able to run, and I rip flesh out with my bare hands. Paring knife is sharp and reachable, yet I rip its rotisserie garlic and other herb-infused left breast flesh out with bare hands, even taking bite without plating first. Animal me comes to light and umbrates, obliterates, well-heeled me. Put on your business casual clothes before work me. Use words that are too big for me like umbrates me. Walk cleanly bipedal me. And I allow the clear juices of the flesh, which has been cooked evenly to 165 degrees Fahrenheit, so it is safe to run down my not shaven for two days stubble face. What arousal I amass from this, this private ritual. With wife of 11 years, busy rearing our two children in one of our two equally as small as my killing filled kitchen bedrooms. As she thinks, I am carefully, gently, caress cutting this Costco procured bird that I am raving for, ravishing in real time. After my splurge of anti-reticent behavior, I pick up paring knife and pare this bird down to four portions. Still lush with mandible pushing bird flesh upward to maxilla, bird flesh now grinding in incisors, canines, premolars and molars, the lust contained, but still unmoored. Ah, uh, this is called sex. Man, it's fun to assimilate, assemble from child's play, curse at the gods, make them from human minds again, birth, the egress digression, curates ancient bone marrow in the modern malaise, and nights consumed with manic prayer, so there it is in full relief, contents plastic and shown through with inescapable light caused by those keeping it hid. To open up the overlays that strike out, that sink in, as the floating debris again washes ashore, the night fills, their silence, their productivity, the emblem of the next to be entombed, entertained by the oldest folk dance. Uh, let's see. This is called Eat Everything. The siege starts without warning. Everyone eating everything. Grim progression of gyrating plates. You know the street's dead, but it ain't stopped the killing. Merchant mercenaries hot for an investment. Ghosts can only wave so long before hands float off and climb hill away from cooling pooling of water. After dirt wiped from static eyes, like it was said, something is decapitated. It ain't like its head was ever in the right place though. It's filthy rich out here beyond the surface. It is belly full of justification and an arch denialism. Coltrane beaming Alabama from the implications. Never knew enough to make it. Tripped up the sour vine floor. Heaven, you and I got a problem. Heaven, intercede on fu or fully join the riot. Just like a pitch to be made in a corporate environment, we do not lack commerce. Just like a gas station parking lot to spit out hey hey babies and metaphor gasolines. Hey hey baby, better gone in whites of their eyes because this is war. Didn't, didn't, didn't they bother to mention that this is life for death, messy mercantilism, my friend. It's called slush. 
Cardinal somehow subtle in snow. Split lip pouring dead star matter into the light. Them like holy static stoic beaten wave. Angel wings coming out of ground like transparent broccoli shrouded in leaf. Hosannas hysterically flee from tavern to tavern with lips pursed, with lips pursed. In the mother ma was Sunday morning, already here, already betrayed. The choir of drunks in dresses and denim trousers, demigods really, demure and amazing, poured out their climax. Deconstruction of Isaiah's vision in real time, in death throes, as if we don't know who'll be holy, holy, holy within this thin apparition night. Let wet the red pool on lip linger so that they may taste the slush rush. Yeah, so this is this has been a lot of fun. I look forward to, you know, meeting when we can meet in person. I look forward to hearing the remainder of the, the program that's to come. Um, just like I was saying, real honored to be a part of this. I'm going to read, I think, one more poem and then call it a day. This is, a, this is called On Minnesota. Stars are vague tonight. Many mother portals open. Wild tongues reach for high flames. Thelonious monk plays brilliant corners on a zephyr. The people lock arms. The ritual calls for blood. Blood where the meaning of blessing is derived. Blessed mother words. Halogen halo street lights insist. Halo halogen light street fight in the dark. Tattered strands of logical conclusions, culminations of deified violence, cataclysmic, shifting bedrock. Thank y'all so much. I'm Brian Cherry. Again, thank you so much. Tilt. Over his shoulder, the wall frame interrupts. Politely at first, urging my attention. Urgently, the more I ignore its leaning angle. Behind his back, the framed painting invades conversation about the kids, about work, about news stories, about consuming less dairy. Outside of his knowing, our framed art hangs at a tilt. Absorbing the details for pickups, the new co-worker's name, fun facts about oatmeal, taunting me to set its angles straight. Sam Pekarski was born, raised, with a Z, in Milwaukee and won't shut up about it. Tends to, be a, tends to a small graveyard of musical instruments and runs a few reading series on the side. No MFA, no PhD, no gods, no masters, just hugs and kisses. Everybody, let's welcome Sam. Hello, I'm Sam Pekarski. Thank you for letting me join you guys once again for National Poetry Month. And I really wish that I could be there in person, but unfortunately I think we all know it's been going on for the past year. This is the second time that I'll be joining you guys right now virtually. And once again, I'm just so thankful to be in the company of so many incredible poets who I love, respect, admire, and can even call friends. I really hope that you've enjoyed the rest of this program so far and as it continues on. And today I think I'm going to be reading a selection of poems that have appeared kind of in print. Um, a pretty good retrospective of pieces about Milwaukee, about myself, about the people I care about, about poetry at large, and kind of all of the above. So thank you once again. Thank you to the other poets. Thank you to Sandy Duffy. And thank you to the team at St. John's on the Lake. It's really just been a pleasure. And let's get going. So I think the first piece we're going to go with is a cute little bit 
I wrote for a friend of mine who I care about deeply, but we're very different. I'm a little chaotic, and he's very, very predictable, and sometimes that's nice. It's called And On This Day. So he's writing again. So he's been taking inventory of the things that come before night and such, of moments collected. The last time, the first time, the rails and the bodies, errant yelling with dissonance, distance. There's something measurable about time, sure and always quantifiable. But the practicality of a graduated cylinder suits him well, something about parallels and lines, and now I'm making this all up. Because quietude has no name, only a few inhabitants at dawn, dusk, days. Because quietude is the smell of dust without presence of age or adage. Because it's easier to say something than do anything. Why bother? Trains can't pause, pressing play when I feel like it might be worth its weight in salt to put my hands to work again. All right. Next up, we have a couple pieces from this collection, Return to the Gathering Place of the Waters. It was put out by Vegetarian Alcoholic Press as a response to a collection that actually started in the 70s with a very different cohort of Milwaukee poets. So we all kind of gathered ourselves near the same place as where the original picture was taken. And once again, I'm joined by a lot of esteemed people who I love, care about, and I'm really thankful to you know, share a city with. This first one is Ode to Milwaukee, kind of the things I love about every corner of the city. I want nothing but the empty street and the wind between buildings, high-rise lofts and cattle lines of twee women at the doorway to that club down on 3rd Street that everybody hates but they still make enough money to keep their doors open for a while. It looked bleak for all of us. I want to go back to the Sydney High building or the raised tanneries that flanked the river. I want to eat at the closed restaurants my grandparents loved before steakhouses grew windows in their secret dining rooms. I want to be blue in a red state and be red with anger at the dismal array of segregated neighborhoods Blunt racism that nobody talks enough about. The city feels its weight while the people wait quietly for something to change and know. To have hope is to have lost. I want to know everything and fear nothing in this gathering place by the water. Watching ships come in, buses ship out, train tracks barren outside of Walker's Point, take a dining car from tavern to tavern or out of town, but the beginning and the end of the Rust Belt is right here. This is spoken language. My lazy tongue spat a train wreck, a haphazard collision of stubbornness, of movement, all aged and apathetic. Sacred mother tongue left bastards to mutate, inside vernacular buried by the speech of the dignified. For rhythm elsewhere, in unmapped, unregarded territory, unabashedly unpolished, across the bastard languages, sums of parts, of parts and smaller parts, ashamed to words in stable shape, the word children of crooked teeth, the smell of stale cigarettes and schlitz, and lazy tongues and lax whispers and violent tirade left to roar in discord. The bastions of oral tradition never wondered. The bellows of men never cared. And in chorus with the other bastards, anti-prodigies in rhythm, paving the streets of low language with their bones, their fresh bones. This is a series of poems written kind of about approaching a day in a way that, approaching a day in the way that you would approach writing a poem, if that makes sense. And I'm not sure it will, but think about it as maybe something that could be heard more atmospherically. Critically, look at these poems. 
They fall across the page like fainting bodies, all structured skirts and lavish fabrics, in pretty caricatures, all of them. Poems like afternoon champagne. Poems like shopping on the internet. These just aren't my bodies. These aren't my shapes. And they fall out of me. I can't place their legs in a strata of my own with this guilt and glide so sudden and so soft with bone breaks instead. Now the stanza's toes touch and I'm screaming, telling him to let go. Sparingly. I want to fight a ghost. I want to fight your ghost. Let that little man of you ooze up to my fists. It holds its shape in midair. And watch me watch it lilt for me. Watch it swell and spin. Spirits spilled and made for this. I collect them like jewels. And as I die again and again, the estate sale becomes even more elaborate. So try to hate me. It's fine. It's fine. It all sits beneath you, losing grip underwater and steam in the sunrise. It says to me, my God, this city sits so sweaty on the hairs of my heart, cuts the strings attached, lets the so-so spirals go awry. It's the air that lets me lick you, so punish that first. And this is breathingly, sighing, fall in love with me. I'm really nice at times, at times. I'm really gentle. I'll try harder, I'll speak faster. And you're a lot to unpack, you're a lot unraveled. It's all here, but where do the bones go? Okay, so. Sometimes I become afraid that I'm diving, I'm dying, and there is nothing left but recourse. And it's like paint, only it's not. How would it so? It's just easier not to. Sighing, again. Okay, so here's another piece, a little weirder one. Forgive me while I try and find it in here. Um, apparently I have to look pretty hard. I thought that I had this thing dog-eared for you. So this collection is curated by somebody um, that lives outside of the city who I met um, while they were traveling in Milwaukee. These are two poems that use the same language and kind of the same themes presented in two drastically different environments. This is Quiet Country in the Name of Fields. Recreating stillness in my home by the ear of the city savvy. I think of the quietude of outlands as a roughened silence where skies consume sounds like the lights, forfeiting memories of stars of wildlife, or the movement of trees with passive shuffle sounds of wind. I think of wrapping darkness and silence in totality. The animals are dead, as still as a thing can be. So I pull my curtains for dampening. My house, it sits dug into the ground, lets its dirt cement shroud hold the streets, and sirens are caught in humid air, shuffling drunks can't pierce through. It's like they've never been actualized. This is how I see the creeping dark of land away from liveliness. It's fidelity to the void, or it's all the ways that I don't know better. Keep my missing memories intact. Let me trust in the silence of far away as it's deafened. This is a series called Eat the. Eat the Anthrosphere. Histories in rust and ice telling their children about the taste of iron fish, of mercury in pores, and the smell of sawdust called forth by the name of a field, of a birdbath left alone, hailing this quiet country. Eat the Anthropocene. What are limbs to me and what's mine? Calling the cold country by the air that it breathes, culling the cold country with air. Harsh light, its digits swimming in sand, and the epiphanies that come with every meal skipped in the name of a field. Eat the anthropologist, whose skin is swimming in linen. How much capital went into its thread count? It's like a sky's worth of shrinking pitches. Tenderly, tender, tinder smoldering, and such skinny fists breathe the gap. A country hushes, a border falling, 
the silence, it is still happening. Pressing onward. Um, these are a couple pieces about bodies of water. And when you think about Milwaukee and water, you think about the lake. Um, but we're a very damp city. There's kind of these pockets of wetness throughout, be it the river, be it, you know, even a puddle on the side of the ground or the reservoirs that used to supply our neighborhoods. Um, just a couple pieces about that. And as an aside, Milwaukee water has a special place in my heart. I almost died of cryptosporidium when I was a kid, but I still trust it. This is watching water in E minor. Bird songs became tornadoes on choppy water. Nervous from the heat, we both sat together, engorged from the salt I carried and the tears it had ingested. Over this marina, with the vessels of rich old men, their middle class minions tucked away, safe from the rise of the filthy sun. I watched water alone again. If only this wasn't the first time I knew loneliness would become me, or maybe I knew that my future would depend on a devout pharmacologist, a magician that wanted to expel the terrors of the lonesome, ignorant enough that he didn't see the bottom of the sea as a cure for despair. Watching water in F ish minor. A harsh and calm, unacceptably still, all molds and decay, veiled secrets of bruises. Little blood trails streaked up, down, by matters of perspective. Combing, fine tooth combing, opaque homogeneity, gradual atrophy into violet wash, blue wash, yellow wash, taking its bow before skin, anything but impolite. And this is calm press D minor. In the dirt cast, grease, air, Crater water and stagnant breath, angular ghost clouds slinging low, waxing at earth, all true signs of incomplete timing. And our ears go pop when we go lower than expected. Our ears ring when we go louder than welcome. Bodies fall in some cool, calculated way. Raindrop drop top, so-so radios say, with Ferris wheel boxes, Munchausen's glory wards, and push-button reveries for all. We're going to end with a couple poems from this collection. Um, it's a very intensive thing that I made in 2018. Um, we're going to start with two poems that are kind of loosely about a trip to Eau Claire, where I kind of came to terms with the fact I'm just a city person. I don't do so well out there. This is for Eau Claire, Movement One, Part Two. Understanding a desire for lawlessness when there's enough space left to ungovern. Houses strewn with snow, built in an effigy of unwet wind. Its breath speaks in such a terse ostinato. Piercingly, she says it's been enough time between cities. She says she's going to be something grave tonight. She says she's going to a show and she doesn't, but says she did. It's softer that way, languid, and so very becoming. Our legs look long in a place without sewers. City tunnels for the sickly creeping vanish in this place. Vanish is a word for city widows. Vanish is a place I'd go to in the Bible, is a light and irresponsibly vacant state of mind, is a stop on the highway, is 15 years of snow shine. Vanish is where I'd go to die if it fits in the itinerary. And out here, I reject the expanse. I resent the chasm between swaths of highway and grass lays about the ditch without a hint of intent stays there until we are so turgid and brown i can't breathe i can't breathe i won't on purpose i said the terror i feel in this place is ineffable it came out as i'm fine with a wash of fear it came out as dead eyes and no heart so i said to this place swallow my name i'll be home soon in the second Part of this poem is movement to part four. 
Something dislodged in me. I'm still the shitty kid I was when I was 16. The same bastard girl that never stood a chance. It's like dredging a fever dream in the air of somebody else's living room. Like dirty laundry hanging in a dead breeze. Recounting a fear of memory. How 2010 sounds like a lo-fi picture. 16 was a hellscape without enough fire. And terror feels like a place I hung my head. I remember it feebly. To usher in something poetic about ennui, I prod sleeping ghosts for this spectacle. Try to tell me how this cherub needs to die. Try to tell me what I wore in the park. We'd meet and tie together by the knee. My body smelled like sharp grass for days. My body, your body, remembers it gently. And memory has its own way of making a style, tarries and reformats bones in their God-given strata. We are so elated, and the band is so elaborate, I can't stomach it even now. And we're going to end with a poem that I wrote after a conversation in a pretty special place to me, um, a bar, the Jazz Estate down on Murray Avenue. Um, I had a conversation with a gentleman about a friend of his that had recently passed away, um, and they were both vocalists, Dick Tate and Floyd Dorsey, respectively. Jazz man says, I miss my friend, like I miss my other voice. My hand hangs lonely, these cuts get shallow, and he says, he was older. He sees it all a little deeper. He knows it was too quick, too catching, but death hit in a soft cocoon, in one year, out the other. Says he won today, says he was lucky, and the machines behaved. Says he don't know how he made it across the street. It was like I was 10 feet tall and bulletproof. He says, I don't know if somebody shot me, but I sure didn't feel it. All right, guys, thank you so much. Once again, thank you to everybody involved in this project. And I hope that in the future, we'll be able to visit you in person, maybe next poetry month, maybe sooner. But either way, take care and enjoy the rest of the poems on this program. Bye-bye. Creatives. The fathers have been wrong. Neither wits nor years have been wasted. Loosely spent, perhaps, scattered and prayed over like seeds. Rejoice the harvest. Turns out the mothers were right about rainy days, though. About positioning barrels under the sky. About dreams plummeting and evaporating. Curse the drought. Never mind the second cousins, supervisors, in-laws, pewmates, classmates, and the warm-hearted ex, ever concerned under the breath, unconvinced and unimpressed. Condescension is a learned language, ill-fitted for the expanse of their genuine affections. Cherish the village. Gather the creatives. Muscles taught from bending, bending humanity into open windows and magic carpet rides. Harness our wattage of will, carrying narratives from the perimeter to the conversation centers. We vibrate with imagination, with abandon, with reverence, with arduous hope. Honor our breath. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you all for scribbling, and thank you all to our poets, our emerging voices, for tending to your journey. We're following you and your words the entire way. <laughs>